there won't be a conference unless we share some data with you. And I would like to introduce our Director of Research and Fiscal Policy, Alan Krinsky, whose job today is to get our blood pumping just a little. Get us a little upset, get us a little fired up to want to do something about something. Um, he will come up and tell us a little bit about the data and to consider that poverty is a policy choice. And the opposite of that choice can get us to economic justice. And Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So today we're here to talk about hope, but I'm here to talk about data. And the data of poverty is are not always so cheery. But at EPI, we believe in data-informed and evidence-based policy. And understanding the data of poverty can help us understand and move forward economic justice. So I want to start by discussing how expensive poverty can be. And this June 2023 Boston Globe article. Some inquisitive and innovative high school students in Massachusetts purchased the same items from two different stock and shops, one in the lower income Jamaica Plain neighborhood and one in the higher income Devon area. And they found that it cost $34 more, 21.2% more, to buy the groceries in the lower income area stock and shop than in the higher income one. So even basic groceries can cost more for people with less money. And this is only one of the many ways poverty can be expensive. So rental costs can often approach mortgage costs. Sometimes in some areas you can see more mortgage costs. And this is without someone getting the benefit of gaining wealth by increasing equity in their home. Fines and fees from various sources can lead to further negative consequences, including accumulation of interest, making them only more difficult to pay. And scholars and journalists have written about some other taxes. They're not really financial um, money kinds of taxes. For example, there's the time tax. How much time people in poverty have to spend negotiating with systems, sometimes the inadequate um, public transportation system, waiting on lines or on hold, all the time it takes to gather documentation to prove that one's in poverty, and to drop through various hoops. And then there's the cognitive again with tax. It is that some people, especially in deep poverty, have mental stress developed from just having to constantly focus on getting what one needs to survive. And then there are always ways some people seek to victimize people in poverty. For example, payday lenders pretend to offer credit to people, but instead they're offering a path to and profiting off of the cycle of debt that can be hard to escape. The data you see here shows that over the last 15 years, Rhode Island has taken up close to a billion dollars in payday loan debt paying millions of dollars each year in fees, most of which goes out of state. In a way, all of these things can be understood as ways of punishing the poor for being poor. And we have to understand that this is a policy choice. Now I want to turn to some basic Rhode Island data for poverty. This is from the Census Bureau's American Community Survey five-year estimates from 2017 to 2021. And you can see from this slide that the poverty rate for black or African American Rhode Islanders, as well as for Hispanic and Rhode Islanders, is twice that or about twice that what it is for white Rhode Islanders. And for children, the situation is even worse. Child poverty, childhood poverty rates in Rhode Island for black African American children, two and a half times what it is for white children, and for Latino or Hispanic Rhode Islander children, it's three times as high. Here, on your left, if you look at um, older Rhode Islanders, those 85 and over have a higher poverty rate than Rhode Islanders in general. And on the right side, for Rhode Islanders with disabilities, there's consistently higher rates of poverty, whether we're talking about being in deep poverty, below 50% of the poverty level, or up to the poverty level, or up to twice the poverty level. Now, whether one technically falls below or above the poverty level, doesn't tell the full story. Plenty of individuals and households above the level still struggle and do not have economic security. Um, at EPI, we publish every other year the Rhode Island Standard of Need. There should be some copies outside. I can leave on a, a link to them on your the table as well. Um, and in the Rhode Island Standard of Need report that we do, we look at what it takes for Rhode Islanders to meet their most basic needs. And then how many Rhode Islanders have fail to have enough to meet those basic needs. 
and so we see on the slide here, uh, on the right side, that for single adults without children on an island, it takes income of twice the federal poverty level just to barely make ends meet. And for single or two-parent families with two, two children, you need to earn well over twice the poverty level to make ends meet. And here we see how today's minimum wage is woefully inadequate to the task of keeping people out of poverty. The, the bottom line in this chart shows the federal minimum wage over the last 80 years. The, the top line shows what the federal minimum wage would have been had it kept pace with worker productivity over the last 50 years. You can see the big difference. If it kept pace with worker productivity, it would be about $23 per hour now. At Rhode Island, we're at $13 per hour, going to $14 in January, $15 a year later. Uh, in Massachusetts, Connecticut, they're already at $15, but all well under what it would have been had it kept pace. Now, to achieve economic justice, we need to understand the racial income and wealth gaps in this country. And like poverty, these are not natural phenomena. They have a history to them. In terms of wealth, most Americans build wealth through home and property ownership, and many do, through so, do so through entrepreneurship. Yet many decades of redlining and ongoing differences in property valuation assessments have resulted in less wealth accumulation by black Americans, but also tend to have less access to capital to start and grow businesses. On this slide, using data from a recent report marking 60 years since the March on Washington, we see how little the income and wealth gaps have narrowed over the last 50 or 60 years. Only a few cents on the dollar in both cases. If we continue at this pace, closing the gap by maybe a penny on the dollar each decade on average, it will take us another 513 years to reach income equity, according to the report, and 780 years to achieve wealth equity. Now, just two weeks ago, we received some startling proof that poverty is indeed a policy choice. The Census Bureau released their 2022 poverty data, the Supplemental Poverty Measure, which is somewhat different from the official poverty measure and takes into account various credits and public assistance, as well as accounting for things like regional difference that the official measure doesn't take into account. And what we learned was pretty startling um, and, and shocking which is that last year, from 2021 to 2022, the, the supplement of poverty rate increased from 7.8% to 12.4% in one year. And for childhood poverty, it was even worse. You can see from 5.2 to 12.4%, more than doubled in one year childhood poverty in the United States. Now, if there's any good news to see in this, is that we know why this happened. We understand the reason, and one of the key reasons was the failure of federal policymakers to extend to renew the enhanced child tax credit and other kinds of pandemic assistance enacted during the pandemic era. And so because we know that that was, it was a policy choice, we couldn't make other policy choices that did not result in this, in this outcome. Uh, this slide shows also the supplemental poverty rate um, shows how, particularly for Black and for Hispanic Latino Americans, the poverty rate actually dropped from 2020 to 2021 pretty significantly, but then went back up even more going into 2020 into 2022. And you see the disparities, the racial disparities um, exist, and perhaps even um, increased. And what this slide shows is not percentages, but numbers of people helped by specific policies and programs, choices, policy choices that they made. Social Security, that was 29 million people, helped um, not just kept out, but lifted out of poverty, and then other tax credits, like the income tax credit, SNAP programs, school meal subsidies, um, housing subsidies, the cash assistance, like the Rhode Island Works program. Tens of millions of Americans kept out or lifted out of poverty from these sorts of policy and program choices. So we see that economic justice is a better policy choice than poverty. And although Rhode Island has some strong policies and programs, our investment in economic justice has not been sufficient. What this chart shows is investments in the Rhode Island Works Cash Assistance Program. You see that the top bars over here are the investment of federal dollars and millions of dollars. And the bottom darker bar is the investment of state general revenue dollars. 
And you see that overall, over the last 25 years, there's been a decline in funding for the program, as to the program. Um, but what's really noticeable is that the investment of state dollars not only declined, but went to zero a little over a decade ago um, and has remained there. And for that child, state's child care assistance program, we spent $48 million less now each year than we spent in 2005. So it's time to reverse this disinvestment in these sorts of policies and programs. Returning here to Rhode Island's standard of need report, you see here how child care and health care subsidies can make the difference between a family having and not having enough to meet their most basic needs. On both the federal and state levels, we can have policies and invest in programs that make a difference in reducing poverty. We could increase the state ITC even further than we did this year um, to be closer to our minute our neighbors that are at 30% or above the federal credit. We increase Rhode Island Works benefits. We could even consider creating a state child tax credit, among other options. And in order to build economic justice, we also need to make sure we have sustainable revenue sources, especially as federal pandemic assistance winds down. And we also need greater tax fairness. Through this, we can generate revenue for programs that help increase fairness and equity and bring economic opportunity and justice for Rhode Islanders. <coughs> So this had to keep in touch with EPI, and I just want to close by sharing my dream of economic justice. Which I've already mentioned this report, the Rhode Island Standard of Need report, that looks at how many, I want to get Rhode Island just to make ends meet, meet and, and, and how too often people fall short of that. And so my thing about economic justice is that we invest and create the kinds of policies and programs that make it so that no Rhode Islander is without the means to make ends meet. And if we can get to that point, that everyone other has can meet their most basic needs, then my dream is that we be able to say we're no longer publishing this report because we don't need to. So Alan's job is to get us upset. That's what he does. Get us fired up, and then we want to do something about it. So thank you for doing your job, Alan. Can you still have hope in this room after hearing all of that? Do we? Come on, people. Do we still have hope? We need to. That is the only way we change these data and this, these numbers around.